Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Real Talk. Jeff here, Brad on the other line. Brad, how are you, sir? What's up, guys? How's everybody doing today? Well, I, I can't speak for them, but I'm good. I'm, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I just <laughs> I'm a little all over the place. Usually we're live, so that, that would be a fair yeah. fair question. But That's fair. Uh, for what it's worth, uh, if this is a mailbag episode. This is what uh, what we had kind of thought about doing this week, rather than last week. We were gonna, you know, we kind of put an X to the the game by game breakdowns. But uh, I'm excited for this. I know you are too. We got lots of questions. We'll try to get to them all. Um, some of these questions, guys. You know, me and Brad. You know, we first off, we didn't do any research. We're gonna take your questions as they as they kind of come in, and we'll we'll read them off and. Uh, you know, for the most part, some of these questions after reading through of them are like, uh, they're kind of a pod in itself, you know, and, and, and Brad agrees. I'll let him get to this in a second, but you know, there's some questions about like NBA predictions, bold predictions, uh, we're, that will be a pod in the next coming weeks by itself. Uh, we will be, uh, jumping headfirst into the NBA season and hopefully providing you guys with some NBA content that you so desire. Uh, Brad, go ahead. Yeah, um, some of the questions we got. Also, we wanted to use the mailbag to see which different sports come in because me and Jeff don't always watch a lot of the the sports you guys might watch in depth. So, you know, as a casual fan, I know some golf, some baseball, a little bit of hockey. But unfortunately for me, the second most sport I watch is soccer, which not a lot of people watch and we don't have any mailbag questions of, I don't believe. So it, it also helps me decide, you know, on a random Tuesday or Wednesday, if I don't really know what to watch, you know, maybe I'll like, turn on hockey or, you know, I have the masters on currently as we're recording now. So it just gives us a chance to kind of broaden our horizons on what kind of sports topics are, you guys, the listeners are really watching. So we're going to give it our best shot here, but there's a lot of, you know, blank minds we're working on that too on our end so i hope you guys enjoyed the listen and i guess we'll just kick it off jeff if you're ready for the first question yeah and i'm gonna piggyback off what you just said you know for me uh you know the nfl i feel like i and i i I know brad does too we have a very broad knowledge of the nfl whether it's our team or another team we have a pretty good understanding of who your second corner is on your favorite team okay or your third receiver is or your backup running back we're i mean we're pretty well versed in that college football i mean for me outside of you know michigan or ohio state are your big teams i struggle a little bit i mean for the most part i think i could tell you all their colleges and roughly how they are but as far as your depth chart we're going to struggle you know and when it comes to like baseball, I'm a Tigers fan. I know your big your big name players around the league, but outside of that, um, you know, I can't tell you who your 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 second string pitcher is, you know, or you know who's playing third base for the Padres right now. But uh, we will try to uh, knock these questions out the best we can. And if we don't go super in depth, I am sorry ahead of time. But uh, I think this will be fun. Yeah, and if you guys listen, and and there's a topic that you are interested in hearing, and we go over it message underneath the podcast in the comments maybe something alluding to whatever question you know maybe something we missed or something that you were hoping we'd bring up but if we missed you can bring it up yourself uh most you guys who put in mailbag questions are pretty active on the facebook page so it's really uh something jeff and i have set up to where all of us can be in group discussions quite a bit the latest one being the kyler murray lamar jackson dispute that was going on this morning so it's a fun it's a fun space for us it's a fun space for you guys and uh Let's just kick it off. Yeah. Let's go ahead and start with the first question. This one comes in from Chris Seibert. He actually did not ask this on the uh, on the Facebook page. He asked it in the comments of the live page, and I wrote it down because I didn't want to forget it. But it is, what are our thoughts on Justin Fields and the current Heisman race? So uh, I'll go ahead and start. Yeah. I've said, I said this um, actually on a pod a few weeks ago. Uh, me and Dan did a pod on Michigan Ohio State preview, and I was pretty open that I thought Justin Fields was going to struggle to get the Heisman this year, strictly because of who they played in their schedule. Uh, now he's jumped off to a hot start, good for him. But with the limited amount of games, they're playing a little bit less games than say an Alabama or an LSU or an Oklahoma, or Georgia, like that, or Clemson. But because of who they're playing and how big of leads they're going to get. I don't think Fields is going to rack up the Heisman 
Heisman savvy stats on the year. Uh, as it sits right now, I would definitely throw him in the race. I would think he's a favorite, but I just don't know if he'll actually end up landing the Heisman Trophy, if I had to guess. I know Mac Jones from Alabama is a strong contender. Uh, Trevor Lawrence, prior to getting COVID, was a strong contender. I'm sure he'll still be a contender. Um, and, you know, there's some other guys, but for the most part, Justin Fields is, has as good a chance as anybody. I just think when you're up 40 in the second half, it's kind of hard to pad stats and try to lock up a Heisman Trophy. Um, quick question. The Heisman's given out after the national championship or before? It is t- typically it's after your, your championship game. So like your big 10 championship, all that before, okay. yeah. before that. And before it's before games. bowl games before anything. Okay. Yeah. Um, I think before the season um, going with Heisman and his draft, we thought he would be not first in the Heisman. Trevor Lawrence had that wrapped up. Everyone assumed. And even in draft stock, they thought, BYU's quarterback Mac Jones or Trey Lance could even go above Justin Fields. I can only go by what I've seen up to date. Trevor Lawrence has now missed two games. I know it's because of COVID not play. That hurts his chances for the Heisman immensely. Yep. And I believe as of right now, the only competition for the Heisman is Mac Jones to Justin Fields. And currently, I would put Justin Fields higher after what I've seen. His completion percentage, and I know you're supposed to beat these teams, but he's making it look so easy. And um, I believe Justin Fields' draft stock has gone up immensely. I think um, Justin Fields has a good chance to be the second quarterback off the board. And right now on my list, if I was voting, Justin Fields would get my Heisman Trophy winner vote. I think he's been unbelievable. And um, if they can win the rest of their games, which it looks like they're going to, and the Big Ten championship handily, it would be very, very difficult for them to not give it to Justin Fields because, I mean, he's just playing lights out. I know maybe that's music to a lot of Ohio State fans' ears listening, but um, I don't know if there's too many people that could disagree because even if they were like, maybe this guy should get it, if Justin Fields won it, you you really can't complain. Yeah, if, if, you know, Ohio State has a game canceled this weekend, they're not going to play against Maryland. So does so, Alabama. Yeah. So Ohio State's only going to end up playing roughly about seven or eight games with the championship game. Okay. If they go undefeated and his stats look somewhere in the vicinity of 30 to 40 touchdowns, he's going to, he's going to get it because they're probably going to go undefeated. So I would assume he would get it. I just think, uh, I don't know what his stats are through three games, but I mean, he definitely doesn't have, I don't think he has 15 touchdowns yet. I mean, that's five I, a game. I mean, it's, you're asking a lot. Yeah, I, I don't think any quarterback's going to do those kind of numbers. I mean, eight games, 30 touchdowns, that's four a game every game. Um, but the efficiency, Joe Burrow. <laughs> the efficiency of Justin Fields is what's been remarkable. He he hasn't missed. He's yeah, he's just yeah. going through the motions. It, it looks like a combine. It looks like a job interview for for Justin Fields, and he's making it look very easy. He looks like an NFL quarterback playing against college defenses. Yeah. Well, let's go right into this next question. Uh, This one comes in from Jared. By the way, I don't know if I said this, but the last one came in from Chris Seibert. This one comes in from Jared Redding. How should Clemson be treated if they get beat by Notre Dame? They got beat by Notre Dame. So we're asking, how should Clemson be treated now that they got beat by Notre Dame? I think it's a really good question. And for me, this is, it's simple. Okay. If Trevor Lawrence comes back and they continue to win, this is a top four team. Their only loss is to a perfect Notre Dame team. Okay. Without not just their best player, with the best player in America. And I I think that's a consensus through a lot of people. The best player in America was not on the field and they came up. By a field goal in overtime, was it? I think it was a touchdown. Regardless, they lose in second overtime on the road with a, with a crowd. There was somewhat of a crowd there, okay? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I put them in as long as they, they finish out the season and they go undefeated. Yeah, um, if you had asked me before the game, I would have said it depends on how they lost. Yeah, I agree. Lost. I agree, yeah. And to be able to go into Notre Dame – and take them to double overtime and have a couple chances to really win the game. Um, Second of all, kudos to Notre Dame. They played a heck of a game. It was amazing to watch, but I think the new, the new polls do it just fine. They, they move Notre Dame up to two, I believe, and they put Clemson at four. 
And that's where they should be. At the end of the year, if Clemson gets in over an undefeated, we'll get to this in a little bit, undefeated BYU or undefeated Cincinnati or one of these other teams that are a cool story and maybe win their conference, the playoffs, Clemson's going to be in there if their only loss is a double overtime loss to Notre Dame. I don't think anybody really sees that differently either. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. Uh, Next question comes in from Nate Ray. Thoughts on Lindor being traded this postseason or this offseason? Where to? Uh, first off, if I'm Cleveland, I try and secure him. Let's start there. Okay? I try to secure him. I give him a contract. If that contract is not able to be worked out, then I'm trying to get – I'm trying as to much get – yeah. yeah, as much value as you physically can. Um. Who's that team? I I don't know. <laughs> I wasn't I wasn't shaking my head no either that you were wrong. I was just like, it's crazy that they haven't secured him really it was going yeah. on in my mind. Um I believe it's uh Javi Baez from uh the Cubs and Lindor are the consensus two best shortstops in the league. Yeah. And I think most people would take Lindor, especially in our area, seeing what he's done for Cleveland. But I've talked to many Cleveland fans, Indians fans about this topic and all of them seem to say the same thing that's why cleveland doesn't win much is because the owner doesn't like to pay and a yeah. salary cap where, where you can pay anybody they don't like to pay so it, going forward Lindor's put it out there i he's going to want to make what he deserves and i don't even think cleveland fans fault him they're more angry at the owner than the player at this point frankie's done everything he can and for the organization and he was even part of their magical run was a year or two ago and um so if if you're not going to sign him, which I don't think they will, you've got to get the most that you can. And you're only going to get offers from a team because his contract has a year and a half left that know that they can secure him going forward. I know a lot of a lot of people throw out the New York Mets, um, the New York Yankees. Obviously, every time you think they're done spending money, they seem to just buy another top tier guy. Um, do the Phillies have enough money to give someone to help Bryce Harper? Um, I I hear a lot about like the Texas Rangers just looking for a star player on their team. It, they can really go anywhere, and it's hard in the MLB because any team, kind of like the Bryce Harper sweepstakes, no one saw the Phillies going for him. And then within like 12 hours, it's like, oh, Phillies going for him. Oh, 10 years all this millions of dollars so yeah. it depends on what team just kind of wants to break the bank for him um i don't know if it'll be another top tier team he might go somewhere where he doesn't have a chance to win really but he's going to make the money that he wants to make um it's it's really hard to tell in the mlb but i do believe like most cleveland fans he will be on the move i don't think they're going to give him the money he did once or deserves which is shocking yeah i don't i don't, I don't... Yeah, I don't know what his kind of player would typically um warrant. Yeah, but you know what? In in today's MLB a lot of guys are getting ten year contracts. I think if Cleveland were to offer him somewhere in the vicinity of seven to eight years at over two hundred million, I think he would take it. I mean, and that's not a bad play. I know it sounds like a lot of money, everyone's like, Oh, you know, but I mean that's that's a that's a great contract. It's, it's just tough in in baseball because you know if they're gonna pay a guy, you think it'd be I think his name's Shane Bieber. He just won the Cy Young Award, and it's like you can have as many g- good batters as you want, but if your pitching lineup sucks, I mean look at the Angels, Mike Trout. Yeah. I think he's unanimously the best player in the MLB over the last two, three, four years, and the Angels can't really do much without a pitching staff. So it. It's real tough in baseball to decide who to pay, and maybe it'll work out for the Indians depending on what they get for them because they could get a lot of prospects and, and you know, offload a big contract and maybe be able to make a more developed all-round team instead of just putting it into your shortstop. So we'll see, but if, if the owner's not going to pay the money, and they're not going to keep him till next year because you can't get rid of him for nothing. You can't just hold on to him for a year and a half and get nothing for him. I, and I believe the sooner they, they part ways with them, the better it'll be for both sides. Yeah. Uh, so we have a ton of NBA-type questions in here. We got lots of them. Uh, Angie Bradish asked a question. NBA 2020-2021 predictions, bowl predictions. You guys, that's going to be a pod. 
coming very soon. Uh, like I, I kind of said that a few minutes ago. And we, we will, I promise you, we will give you great NBA content coming to you very soon. Uh, the next question, I don't know how much you would know about this, but you can probably speak at least a little bit to it. Uh, this one comes in from Eric Murray. The producers who did The Last Dance, the Michael Jordan documentary, are reportedly in talks with doing one for Stone Cold. Uh, Steve Austin, for those of you guys don't know, the, the, the I mean, huge mid-90s, late-90s WWE star. Um, very famous for cracking open beers and 316 and uh, middle fingers and stuff. So a lot of people our age, I mean, kind of grew up with Stone Cold, even if you're not even somewhat of a wrestling fan. I mean, uh, first off, you're not a wrestling fan. I know this, but you did watch the Last Dance documentary. If if somebody did something like that following somebody like Stone Cold, what, what would be your initial thoughts? So, so a couple of things. One, I think in all of TV, documentaries are a huge hit, whether they're about murders or about athletes or about anything, really. Documentaries... There are eight to ten episodes. You can sit down for a weekend or take a week or two, and boom, you can knock it out. Um, and they did a fantastic job for Michael Jordan. So me personally, I've never once seen a wrestling match. But I would find it hard to believe anyone over the age of 19 doesn't know who Stone Cold Steve Austin is, maybe even younger. And you know, or at least I have been under the assumption, his biggest rival was The Rock. It correct? is The Rock. It is so rock. you know Dwayne Johnson is going to be all over this this interview part of the interview process talking about it, and then you know that's probably going to bleed into over him doing a documentary about how he started in football, then went to wrestling, then as an actor. So I I don't believe when you have these celebrities that are just like they've reached immortality really to have a documentary to learn more about the ins and outs and to learn more about these people. I think it's absolutely phenomenal. And if they made one on Stone Cold Steve Austin. I would absolutely watch because it also gives me a, a window into what the WWE is really like without having to watch WWE. Because I know a lot of people like it, including you. But to me and maybe a lot of people watching, I, I look at it and the first thing I think is like, it's just too silly, man. I, I just I can't get into it. You know what I mean? But mm -hmm. a lot of people really like the WWE. I don't think there's any borderline watchers. You either love it or it's like uh, WWE. So yeah. to be able to watch a documentary, this little sideshow of what one of the best wrestlers ever what his career was like i think it's phenomenal I, I i would watch it and i find it hard to believe anybody who has a little bit of free time wouldn't tune into at least a couple of these episodes to, to, to learn some stuff yeah uh i have a few major bullet points with this okay first off if uh if the people that are doing the last dance want to grab somebody from the wwe first off fantastic choice to do stone Great. cold I mean, there's there's really only two others that are even remotely in the conversation um, for all time popularity as far as popularity. The Rock, Hulk Hogan. I mean, outside of that, put, put John Cena in there. John Cena more current, but so here's my next bullet point. Yeah. Okay. 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 In the in the late '90s, Stone Cold Steve Austin really arose in 1996 with the whole Austin 316. Says I just whooped your ass. Okay, a lot of people see the Austin 316 T-shirts in the late 90s and into 1997 is when this 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 storyline really kicked off and it became big. 1998, it like it was like moving up and then it was like the stock market for like Tesla it just went like this straight straight through the ceiling. It's like holy cow. And in in late 97, Stone Cold actually broke his neck in in the ring and. He was kind of plateaued by injuries throughout 98 and in 90, late 99. He was really plateaued from injuries, had to be on the sideline for a little bit, had a little bit of a career in 2000, and it slowly tapered off into 2002 when he finally retired uh, in early 2003. There is nobody that has a more influential career, though, as far as the business. It was at an all-time peak. Uh, pe pe people are, I mean, spending millions of dollars on Stone Cold merchandise and, and to watch pay-per-views. Like, uh, could you, can you imagine spending $30, $35 a month to watch Stone Cold every single month? You know what I mean? And, and what his, his, uh, journey was. And at the time he, he feuded between two people. You, you asked who was his, his number one rival. It was the rock in the ring, but outside the ring, it was Vince McMahon, the boss. You know, and, and that storyline is what elevated wrestling to all time heights because everybody could relate 
to a blue collar working man who drank beer, who hated his boss. Everybody relates to that. Everybody. So it's like Stone Cold, he's God. I mean, everybody kind of like, that's who I want to be. And every time Stone Cold comes out on Monday Night Raw, he's kicking the boss's ass or he's kicking this rich rock guy, you know, who's talking all this smack and he kicks his ass too. And it's just like, everybody loves Stone Cold, you know? So perfect idea. So much meat on the bone. Yeah. Probably the number one meat on the bone is what you kind of alluded to. Wrestling. You said it's kind of silly. The behind the scenes of wrestling is the most intense and grueling. No, that's not. Grappling. I've I've read some stuff on it. Yeah, I mean that all is is right what you just said, but actually what I'm thinking of is like it's so secretive. The idea no, that two yeah. men that two men are coinciding to script a wrestling match and then put it on for you to make it believable. That process is so guarded and hidden and secretive and, and buried treasure. And for, there's so much meat on the bone here. It's a great idea. Uh, and a counter, a counter topic here. This is being also reported and, and Eric didn't bring it up. So I'm going to bring it up here. As good of an idea as this is Netflix just recently, it's being leaked out. So Netflix did not leak it out, but it's being leaked out that Netflix has picked up, um, a massive contract with the WWE to do a Vince McMahon documentary. And if there's anybody that's like a bigger. He's the head of it all, isn't he? He's the head of it all. He oversees everything. That's why he's a billionaire. He's a billionaire. He's the creator of Monday Night Raw. He is the creator of WrestleMania. He did not create pro wrestling, but he created the things that everybody knows. I mean, you know the WWE. You don't know wrestling. You know WWE or WWF in the 90s. You know WrestleMania. You know Monday Night Raw. He created those things. He brought. He made it public. He took it public. And, and you can literally go right now on your phone and buy WWE stock. Um, there's so much meat on the bone with that. Netflix is apparently spending the most money they've ever spent on a documentary series for Vince McMahon. Look for that in the future. I think that's huge, too. Yeah. All right. Moving right along. Our famous topic here. <clears throat> Eric Murray with another great question, two in a row here. So he did say that the NFL had a boring trade deadline, which they did. But here's his question. Thinking around the league that the salary cap will decrease by roughly $23 million, what kind of impact will that have on players, contracts next year with cap-strapped teams? So let's start here. First off, your, your top four teams in cap space next year, I think, are the Jags, the Browns, the Colts, and the Patriots. Is that? I think so, yeah. I, I know the, the Colts, the Colts, Jaguars, and Patriots in there. Browns might be one of the top four. I think it's – maybe it's the Browns, maybe it's not. If it's not the Browns, it's one of the teams. But those three for sure. Um, I mean, first off, the, the, biggest, the biggest thing that I think here is the Chiefs, the Rams. The, those teams have already paid a lot of players. Obviously, uh, the Chiefs went out and spent $500 million. And obviously, that's not all coming out next year. But uh, it's a massive cap hit. So for those teams to have to drop $23 million, the first name that comes to mind for the Chiefs for me is Sammy Watkins. He's probably out. He probably will not be a Chief next year. Uh, probably Frank Clark as well would probably be out. Anybody that's not locked up long-term that they can kind of move on and get pieces to try to finagle some cap room, they would be cap casualties. Uh, anybody struggling with the cap is going to be even more affected. New England obviously has a kind of tap room. But it's a lot of it because they're losing players. So look for them to to struggle to kind of fill out their roster, even with the cap space. Um, I don't know what's your what's your take on this. Obviously, roughly roughly two hundred five million dollars in cap space for all NFL teams. It's going to drop roughly, leaving us at about one hundred eighty ish somewhere in there. Yeah, um, I mean, you're going to have to ask your veterans to to restructure a lot of contracts. I know the Steelers have got ahead of this with some of their offensive linemen. And uh, Big Ben also restructured their contract. It's going to be difficult for a lot of teams who have a lot of good young talent. Like, how do you determine who gets max deals, who who signs what? I know the Steelers have Bud Dupree, T.J. Watt, and Minka Fitzpatrick. They all have to sign. Like, who goes? What do you do? There, there's a lot of lot of ups and downs. But I feel like peop, um, players are going to be more harshly criticized for their performances. You know. Um, Jerry Jones is always involved in what's going on in the league. Maybe this is why he waited to pay Dak. Not that he knew the injury was going to come, but maybe that's why he paid some of the other guys early and waited for the salary cap hit before paying Dak Prescott. Um, 
I don't know. I, I've never been too familiar with the salary cap. I, there's not really much I know or or in depth how how it ascent. I get how it works. You, you obviously have to. You have this much money to pay your entire team for that season, so it's got to be spread across. I get all that, but it's obviously just going to make the league. It's going to make it harder to have good players and the running back market, which is already low is going to go even lower. Wide receivers aren't going to be able to make as much money. Your pass rushers are going to have to take a little bit of a pay cut. You know, those are typically the quarterback wide receiver and pass rusher. Those are the three highest paid positions right now in the NFL. They're all going to have to lower their asking price, which is really hard because you know, everyone wants the most money they can make and what they feel they deserve. Ultimately, it just makes the entire NFL harder for front offices and for players who feel like they're at the top of the, their game. I mean, there's nothing easy about lowering the salary cap, but I get why you have to have one. Yeah, you know, contract year players, and I'm, I'm not sure exactly who a lot of those are. I know the number one contract player in the league right now is Dak Prescott, but uh, they're going to struggle to get what their, their full value is. They're just going to. And I think a lot of players will probably be okay with playing on a tag this coming year because they don't want their long-term deal to be affected by a decrease in cap. This first decrease in years, it hasn't decreased in a very long time. So yeah, huge. Moving around to Langer, moving back to college football. We got another one from Eric. His third question in a row here. Uh, Mid-major schools with potential to crash the FBS playoff. Those teams would include Cincinnati, who's currently ranked 7th at 6-0, and BYU, currently ranked 8th at 8-0, and and then you have Coastal Carolina at 15th, they're 7-0, and and then Liberty, ranked 22nd at 7-0. and I think we're both in agreement here, but I'll let you start. Um, this has a really, really high chance to make for some cool, unique bowl games. Um, because they're, they're rated high and they're undefeated and they get a chance for bowl games. There's a couple teams that would have to absolutely shit the bed for for one of these teams to make the playoff. There's no chance. If there was a six or eight team playoff, yes, you, you could have no problem sneaking in one or two of these teams. But Alabama, Notre Dame, Ohio State, Clemson, one of those four teams would have to really, really screw up because a one loss team out of any of those makes it over any uh, Cincinnati or BYU. Um, not saying it's justified or I get the whole, you're high enough, you're good enough, and you're undefeated. I agree with those. But we're talking about the committee, the college football committee. There's been a playoff since, what, 2014 now? We, we've seen enough of how this committee votes and what they value. There's... You're not going to say none, but there, there, there's just, it's not likely. It's not likely looking at how Alabama looks, how Notre Dame won against Clemson, how that's going to hold up even if they lose down the road. Clemson, their only loss is Notre Dame. Do you really see them losing again? And Ohio State, it looks like they're going to run the table. I mean, I, it, it's, it's an interesting topic, and it would be cool, but realistically, I don't, I don't think it's, it's likely at all. Yeah, I'm actually with you here. I uh, I, I just I I, I had to have a hard time, a hard time, making the case for them over Alabama, Notre Dame, and Ohio State, and I'm assuming that those three teams are going to win out. Pure assumption here, okay? But even with one loss, let's pretend they all have one loss. I would have a hard time seeing Cincinnati get over those teams, okay? Then Clemson is your fourth team. Clemson with Trevor Lawrence. Or Cincinnati? Ask yourself that question. Clemson with Trevor Lawrence or BYU? Ask yourself that question. You know where I'm going with this. The committee. It's not, it's, it's not fair. The committee is taking Clemson with Trevor Lawrence over really any team in the league not named Alabama, Notre and Dame, BYU, or Ohio State right now. And BYU's last two games are San Diego State and Northern Alabama. Their only win versus a ranked team. Granted, they crushed B or they crushed uh, Boise State who was ranked 21 at the time. But currently you look at their entire schedule, none of those teams are ranked or really even close to being ranked. They're just, uh, you know, they got out to a start before the Big Ten and the Pac-12, and they've won a lot of games. And their quarterback is a, you know, he's going to be in the draft. But I don't think the committee could justify putting in 
BYU over one of these teams. They could, but I believe we all know deep down the chances are so small. And looking at what the committee has done in the past over some tight calls, still putting in the top powerhouse or, like uh, schools, that's just how it's going to be. Until we get a 16 or an 18 playoff, that argument can be for a little bit of another day. Until they expand the playoffs, if they ever do, one of these dark horse, cool story teams aren't going to be able to have a chance for a natty. Completely agree. Completely agree. That and I've been a big, uh, a big believer and a big preacher of eight games. I think eight games is the magic, or eight teams is the magic number, for lots of reasons. I've proposed many things. Uh, look back at the Michigan Ohio State preview episode. I go pretty much in depth on an eight team playoff, but with an eight team playoffs, you'd actually be looking at Cincinnati or BYU or both getting in. So and then and then you're I, think, I mean, well you're looking at Alabama versus BYU in the first round, and then it would be Notre Dame versus Cincinnati. Yeah, number three is Ohio State. I don't know who six is. Is it Georgia or are they five? No, it'd be Texas A&M, actually. Yeah, so, I mean, you're even looking at those teams, and it's like, I don't know. Yeah, I, A&M you know. has one loss. It would be cool if there was an 18 playoff in this situation, but unfortunately, they're going to keep it as four, and the powerhouse schools are going to roll. Yeah. Moving right along here, uh, I wish I was more versed in this conversation, but it's Masters Week. This one comes in from Jared Redding. Uh, who wins, who are the dark horses and how does tiger fare? Let me, let me start off and then I'll let you kind of take it away. Um, you know, I don't know who's going to win, but tiger's a defending champ and that's who I'm rooting for. I think he's, uh, he's the best thing for golf. And when tiger wins, people watch, I can promise you, I, I haven't watched a lick of golf today, but if I'll have it on tomorrow, if tiger's within, if tiger has a chance to win, I'll probably flip it on. So just like I did last year when they got down in crunch time, I'm like, I, I have to turn it on. Yeah, um, Tiger Woods is obviously good for golf. As we're recording this, um, Masters has been underway all day. So I'm going to kind of kick it off there. Paul Casey, um, for as close to great as he's been, he's been a consistent good. He's had a lot of close finishes. Not a very popular golfer. I didn't really know much about him until today, but he shot seven under. Great, great opening round. Um, all the all the top-name players are playing really, really well. you got Fowler, Wallace, um, Woods, who we've alluded to, is currently tied for uh, fourth now, but he shot four under, first bogey-free round in a long time. Uh, Mickelson's going. Uh, DeChambeau's the only one who's not playing like you think he would, but I believe all of us who play golf, wow, can he crush it off the tee? I believe it was in practice. They said with carry and roll, he hit a like a 412-yard drive or something like that. It's incredible. Um Adam Scott, I believe you guys all saw that. I don't know if it's pronounced Ram or Ram, but the hole-in-one you posted in practice, they should let him start with a stroke lead for that <laughs> hole-in-one. Jeez, oh, Pete. But um, I, I'm getting, I've been getting more and more into golf. Um, I don't really watch it as the main thing, but if it's on my second TV, um, I, I do like to pay attention to it. I have a couple friends who are big into golf. Um, I know some of you on the podcast, Nathan Ray, Jordan Hall, that I know closely that you guys are really big into golf. Um, it seems like everybody's shooting pretty well. It seems like the weather's really given them uh, some soft greens and everyone's playing aggressive, which is really fun to watch. You're seeing some good scores. And um, I think we're going to see a lot of top names make the cut into the weekend. And if Tiger Woods, if he can keep playing like he does now, he could go back to backs. He's here on the Masters, which would be really cool. Um, I don't know how he how close he is to the uh, to the record in majors, but I know he's really close. He might even be tied. I I'd have to go look into that. But he's within four or five. Yeah, and he he's he's right there. So everyone's playing well. Um, as for dark horses and favorites, I know Dustin Johnson's the number one in the world, and I think I just had him here. Um, he had an eagle on the second hole, I believe. Uh, Spade. Uh, Jason Day, they're all out there. They're all playing really well. I think they're all better than even. So uh, you got Finau. It, I guess I could just keep naming golfers. That'd be cool, right? But uh, everybody's playing well. Everyone's shooting under. And it's probably going to take, you know, after four days, it's probably going to take about a, maybe a higher than an 18 under to take this tournament the way it's looking right now. Maybe even 20. Okay. 
Uh, moving right along here, this one comes in from Angie Bradish. Which number will be higher, Steelers losses or Jets wins? So before we go any farther, okay, the the Steelers are eight and zero. Eight and zero, right? <laughs> yep. Jets are zero okay. nine. Yep. So here are the rest of their games: Cincinnati at Jacksonville, home against Baltimore, home against Washington, at Buffalo. At Cincinnati, home against Indianapolis, at Cleveland. Uh, at Max, I have them losing three games. At Max, I believe they lose two. Okay, I don't know who they are. I just I can't see Pittsburgh going fifteen and one. I don't think they're. I don't think there's any team that's going fifteen and one or better this year. That includes the Chiefs. That includes um, the Steelers here. Okay. The Jets, they are 0-9. Here's the rest of their schedule. They're on a bye this week. Okay, So coming off a bye, they're going to be at the Los Angeles Chargers, home against the Miami Dolphins, home against the Raiders, at Seattle, at the Rams, home against Cleveland, at New England. The Steelers' loss, this is going to be higher. It will be. It's, it's harder, it's harder to, to win games than lose them. And the only game the Jets have played well is against the Patriots. I believe we all think the Dolphins are better. That little two-game stint against the Seahawks, Rams, losses. Coming off the bye, I still think the Chargers beat them. I, I think the Jets at max win two games. I expect them to win none, actually. I expect the Jets to go 0-16, be the third team to do so behind the Lions and uh, Browns. And, yeah, the Steelers, I believe, have have four losable games left on their schedule. They have the Ravens, the Bills, the Colts, and the Browns. Um, I do put the Browns on there. Actually, you know, two two games against the Bengals left. Joe Burrow looks really good. You never know when it comes to in-division. Um, but, yes, the Steelers at 13-3, and three, I believe, is about what they're expected, at least from me. Uh, hopefully we can continue to win every game. I'm going to pick them in my pick as such. But – the Jets don't look like they're a team that can win a game, so they might be able to pull one off, maybe two with a prayer, but I, I do think the Steelers' losses will be higher than Jets' wins. Hopefully yeah. they're both zero. For what it's worth, if I had to predict right now, not predict, but just like just like pick blindly, I'm taking the Jets to lose every single one of these games. If they win one, they win one, but I'm not picking them. And then the Steelers, I would pick them to win every single one of those games. I don't expect them to win all of them. I do expect a loss or two. Um, but I would pick them in every one. I think they're a better team than every team that's left on their schedule. But going undefeated, is, is it's happened once in, in my lifetime. So to sit here and say that it's going to happen, it's not going to. One of these teams will probably upset them. It's any given Sunday. Um, spoiler, but I think Cincinnati might give them trouble this week. We'll see. Uh, do I think they'll win? Probably not, but we'll see. But I do. I agree with you. Steelers have a higher, higher number than the Jets, but it won't be by much. It won't right. be by much. Uh, NFL teams with a new coach next year. I mean, we'll go quick into this one. This one comes in from Andrew Bradish. Uh, off the top of my head, the Texans, obviously. And I, I think the Lions. I think the Lions will probably move on from their coach after this year. Those are, um, I mean... Off the top you, of my head. I also want to ask, like, kind of, I'm thinking new coaches in, like, their coach will get fired in the offseason. Yeah. Like, I believe the Falcons will have a new coach, but Dan Quinn's already fired. Okay, yeah. So, yep. So, them too. Um, but I, I think Detroit fires their coach on Black Monday and has a new one. Yeah. Um. It. Jets. I don't think Adam Gase is. Uh, going, wow. Is, I, I can't believe I didn't. Yeah. Sorry. Right. Um, I don't think he's going to keep that job. Um, goodness, teams that are, it could be a one and done for Mike McCarthy. Um, he I says it's not, he's pretty well, adamant about he's it. going to say it's not, but yeah. they suck. Um, yeah, he hasn't, he's, I don't know. Mike McCarthy, he wouldn't shock me if he wasn't there um, next year. Yeah. Um, I do like the interesting idea and i know this will take a lot longer to get into but some stuff i've heard and i've kind of thought of it more on my own and how it could potentially be something um 
maybe we see the Patriots with a new coach. Not because Bill's fired, but it'll be a longer conversation. I'm not saying Bill would get fired, but maybe Bill doesn't want to be coach of the Patriots anymore. Who knows? All right. Story for a different story for a different pod. But all all I want to say is that same reaction as when people said Tom Brady won't be a Patriot. That's all I'm saying. That's that was the same reaction from most Patriots fans. And I get it. It's it's clearly more unlikely than likely. It's a shot in the dark. But like there are some scenarios where you're like, I guess if that happened two years later, you'd look back and be like, okay. I guess it wasn't that crazy. You know I, guess, I, guess, I guess, let me back up. Why wouldn't he have left and just left Brady there then? Um, well, Why one, would he allow Brady to leave and succeed and then leave? Well, I guess he still believed that no matter what the roster was and what the relationship was, he still had a chance to win Super Bowls with Brady. I just look at, like, just for one example, I guess, you know, let's run it with Cam and see what happens. Let's see how much Brady meant to my team. You know what I'm saying? Maybe he needs to see, he needs to figure that out too. He's had Brady for 20 years. Okay, it's not working. the The division I'm in, the Jets are probably going to get Lawrence, Josh Allen, and Tua Tonga Viola are all there, and I don't have a quarterback. They just gave Josh McDaniels an extension recently, right? Okay, they basically groomed him to be the next head coach. Let Josh Allen deal with it, or Josh Daniels. I'm sorry, Josh McDaniels. And who was rumored? Dark rumor, but who is rumored to want to play for Bill Belichick and who is going to be maybe traded or free agent to the Patriots? Deshaun Watson. Watson. They have a head coach and GM position open. That's what he is for the Patriots. He can move right into the Houston Texans in that terrible division where the best team is coached by Mike Vrabel, who he knows very well. And he could have Deshaun Watson and try and, you know, build there. Or you look at a team like the Jaguars who are in a nice climate in the the same terrible division and have the most cap space in the NFL. If the chargers decide, you know, it's not our quarterback. We have our quarterback. Maybe, you know, um, Anthony Lynn, isn't the answer. He goes to LA and he gets Justin Herbert and a really good roster in LA. I just think those are three locations that like bill could go to Houston, have all the power and Deshaun Watson for the next five years and see what he can do down there. Like, just because Tom Brady left doesn't mean Bill has to stay. Let Josh McDaniels have his time. You know, maybe maybe Bill Belichick's relationship with Kraft is a little broken after not being able to move off Brady when he wanted to with Garoppolo. I'm just saying if, if you're not in a position to get Lawrence or really Trevor Field, say they win three or four more games, you're not going to get either of those players. The rest of your division, well, maybe not the Jets, but the Dolphins and Bills are certainly trajectorying up. Why not go start fresh? I mean, I'm not saying it's it's likely or going to happen, but I'm just saying there's a few scenarios where, you know, in two years, if the Texans are in the playoffs, Bill Belichick, GM and head coach with Deshaun Watson, who's built a pretty good roster, you're like, yeah, maybe it maybe it was both of their time in, in New England, and then they go separate ways. I just think Tom Brady earned the right to choose where he wanted to go and pick his roster, anybody who's taking him. Bill Belichick could go to almost any GM and say, I want to be your head coach and GM. You think the Texans owner is going to say no to Bill Belichick? I'm just saying it. it's not likely I get that, but it's something that it's like I wouldn't be like caught off guard or shocked. That's all I'm trying to get. I guess at the end of the day, that's what I'm getting to people. If something like that was to happen, don't be super shocked. Try and take a back seat and look at like the ups and downs. Why did Josh McDaniels go to take a head coaching spot two or three times and still come back? It's because he's going to be the next head coach of the Patriots eventually, or you'd at least assume so. Why not now? Yeah, I think you're onto something in, in a way, but I it think gives Patriots fans an out. You know, they still believe so hard in the Patriots because you still have Bill. Well, both yeah. of them on any shit talk that comes out, you just be like, "Well, we lost both goats." It gets so easy for Patriots fans. We lost both the goats. <laughs> what do you want us to do? You know what I'm saying? Like, no, truthfully, I. There is a there's a pattern with Bill Belichick, okay? He's never been south, and I don't think he ever would. He is a northeastern kind of guy. I think he I think he understands football better than even we think he understands football, okay? If he were to ever leave again, I think it would go to one place, truly, back to New York. I think he would be a Giants coach again, not the Jets. He wants no part of the Jets. He hates the Jets, but Truthfully, I think he 
I think he looks back and he is sad that he was never the head coach of the Giants. I think he won, I mean, after he won two Super Bowls there as a defensive coordinator, I think he I think he thought it was earned to him that he was going to be the guy, and he should have been, obviously. <laughs> I mean, it's pretty proven now at this point. But I think ultimately I he would want to go there. I can't see him just. It's funny that a whole that, other conversation. The team that beat him at the Super Bowl twice, like is New York Giants. Like there's so much. Coincidence? So I don't think so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> get those reasons, baby. All right, next yeah. question. We you got a little side track there. Ne- next question. You guys enjoyed that, though. I don't know. Maybe you thought something was in there. A little nugget. Ah, uh, where are we at here? So, Andrew Brash with another one here. NFL award predictions at the midway point. Again, we're reading these guys, so you guys know. We're reading these and then literally answering. We didn't do much research. So, we're just going to do real quick. Don't beat us up if we get your favorite player or something. Go ahead. I also just want to say, like, for you guys watching this podcast, I hope the view counts high. But, like, when you we do these mailbox questions, this happens more than you guys we'd like to admit. But, like, I'll call Jeff or he'll call me with a question. 53 minutes later, we're hanging up the phone. So, yeah. like, this is just like a phone call that we're recording for you guys. And hopefully you can pick out different perspectives or thoughts or nuggets that you might not have thought of. But um, I'll let Jeff kick it off. Uh, do you want to start with MVP? We'll start with MVP. For me. It's one guy. It's Patrick Mahomes. I 25 agree. touchdowns, one pick. You've lost one game at this point. Uh, you, you're the consensus. I, I Russ has been great. Love Russ. He ain't better than Patrick Mahomes this season. Uh, what Patrick is doing is, is unreal. Obviously, his team is way better. It's not even close, but he would be the MVP right now. I 100% agree. Um, teams 8-1. Uh, their one loss was close. Patrick Mahomes playing lights out. The he, best player on arguably the best team. Yeah. Offensive player of the year. I think you could very easily give that also to Pat Mahomes, but I'm going to try and stray. Uh, Alvin Kamara. Uh, see, I, I was going a little bit of recency bias, but like. Dalvin I was, Cook. I was going to go Dalvin. Him and Derrick Henry are like 200-some yards in rushing. I know Alvin Kamara at one point was top five receiving leaders, too. So all-purpose yards, I'm sure he's up there. But I, I but think my, he has the most combined yards between rushing and receiving in the league. Combined he yards. Might, and, and he lost his co-star and Michael Thomas for the yeah. whole year. Yeah. Um, I don't think Alvin Kamara is far off, but it, it would be awfully hard if Russ didn't get MVP for him to not win Offensive Player of the Year, which would be kind of counterproductive. like giving it to a quarterback and not them again or a different quarterback would be a little hazy, but going off the books, you got Kamara. I got cook, I think, but like, yeah, because without cook, the Vikings might not have a win. Yeah, he's been, I know. I agree. The last two weeks, he's just carried the team. Yeah. Uh, comeback player of the year. We gave these in our bold predictions. And for me, uh, I think we said in the bold predictions, it would be very hard to beat Ben Roethlisberger unless Alex Smith potentially came in and had a – unfortunately, he has not looked good in either of his two plays. If he would have been mediocre, he might have won. He's just looked terrible. He's looked awful. Uh, it's Big Ben for me. It's, I don't think too many people could have – I mean, the team's undefeated, and they were eight – they won eight games last year. In eight games, they've won eight already this year. Yeah. And really, he's the only position that's changed. It's the same team. Chase Claypool, a draft pick. But again, is he the same with Mason Rudolph under center? Yeah, it's, it's Big Ben's been incredible the shot first two weeks, but then he kind of fell off a cliff there. But yeah, it's, Big Ben's running away with it right now. Uh, defensive player of the year. Yeah, I, I've got two, and I, I don't know statistics, but just the two names I've heard the most: Aaron Donald. Because I mean, he's Aaron, Aaron Donald. Yeah, he, he's literally got a highlight clip every game. Whether he's getting to the quarterback or not, triple teams, double team, he's smashing them. He's got to have all sorts of records. I'd like to give it to someone on the Steelers, but it's just kind of been a collective effort. It's not really one guy standing out. Yeah. The other guy, though, is uh, Darius Leonard. Darius Leonard from the Colts. The Colts defense has kind of shocked everyone with how good they've been. Yeah. And, and Leonard's the leading tackler on that team, and, and he was snubbed of defensive rookie of the year. And he was left off the uh, he was left out of the Pro Bowl the year he had like 112 tackles or something like. Darius Leonard has been biding his time. I I think he's not he's not too far off from Defensive Player of the Year. 
What you got? Uh, those are good ones. I'm going to give you two separate ones. I know you're not trying to be biased. TJ Watt's been spectacular this year. Definitely deserves a little bit of credit. And then it's hard to choose between the two because you said, just like you said, the Steelers are collective effort. Levante David and or Devin White, both of them have been fantastic. I think I would get, I would put Levante David just slightly above him. Um, but outside of that, it kind of falls into the Steelers group where it's collective effort. Uh, obviously, both of those teams' front sevens are just dynamite. Uh, moving right along. Oh, uh, rookie of the year, offensive rookie of the year. This is a tight race. There's been a bunch of guys who fluctuated. Um, C.D. Lamb was doing really well, then his quarterback yeah. got hurt. Justin Jefferson had a three-game spike. Chase Claypool seemed unguardable there for a while. Jonathan Taylor's had some good – it's got to be Clyde Edwards-Hilaire, though. If we're really looking at it, he just popped into my mind. He, he was like fourth-leading rusher in the NFL as of last week. I think. Can, I, can, a, can, I, can I throw two names out that you're, you haven't mentioned? I, I might be I, – I might just – you They're are. Quarterbacks. I'm staying away from. <laughs> okay. Okay. Joe, Joe Burrow. I, yes. One of them are probably going to win it. Justin 100%. Herbert leads the league in 300 yard games. Joe Burrow off the charts. I'm just trying to give some other rookies some credit. I, this is a two man race. Two is sweet, but just got a late start. He's not going to be able to catch those other two guys statistically. Maybe because his team's probably going to have a lot more wins. He could maybe sneak in. But they're not. Gonna, he's not going to do enough to where he wins it over Burrow or Herbert. They've been the two biggest talking points throughout the whole season. Yeah, and, and, and yes, for for me, too. as great as Burrow's been, uh, Herbert's been great too. So it's really a coin flip there. If we're giving it to nobody of those guys and we're going to skill players, uh, for me, it's either Lamb or Clyde Edwards-Helaire for sure. I think Helaire is going to run away. It's going to be the two quarterbacks than him. I mean, yeah. he's he's going to end the season probably top five leading rusher, and his team's going to have two, three losses only. It's it, it's probably going to be the Fresh Prince of Bel Air. Yeah, uh, defensive rookie of the year. I think Chase we talked Young's about this the other day. What's but, that? Well, I said Chase Young's played well, but I think we were both in agreement that it's Anton Winfield Jr. Yeah, but he's been incredible. That, uh, the whole secondary for Tampa's 24 years and younger, and he's kind of taken lead there immediately from first snap, and, yeah. and he's played really well. Again, it's behind that dominant front seven, but players got to play, and he's been making a lot of plays this year. Yeah, he definitely uh, deserves his credit. Uh, I think that pretty much wraps it up, right? Yeah. yeah Coach, of, Coach of the year? Mike Tomlin. It's got to be. It's got to be uh, Mike Tomlin. You kept, your, you kept it afloat for 8-8 eight and eight last year. And what do you do? You come out and you win your first eight games. Is it? I mean, gosh, it, it's got to be Tomlin. If it's not Tomlin, who else? See I, see, I got nothing. See, the thing is, is like you could say Andy Reid, but like I feel like we're we're downplaying what Andy Reid's doing simply because consistency. Like we expect it out of him, and I don't want to hold that against him. Oh, I actually got somebody. Dolphins. Uh, what's his name? Brian Flores. Okay, he's, that's a good one. That's not what I was thinking of. Help me out, coach of the Cardinals. Why am I? I'm drawing blank. Oh, Cliff Kingsbury. Kick, yeah, definitely deserves the team, the talk. I, I just think the team's been too up and down for him to win it. Uh, like they, they look dominant, then they get beat real bad, and they, you know, they've just kind of been yeah. kind of floating all over the place. To be fair, the award has almost always gone to a bad team that turned good the following year, no matter what the your Dolphins. record is. It could be the Dolphins coach. Because Belichick has, like, literally, like, one Coach of the Year award. Like, one. What's his name? Brian Flores. Thank you. Brian Flores. Yeah, I said I, it already. You hear Eric, I know. I, I know. I heard it. I just I keep wanting to say Eric Bieniemy, but he's the oh. OC for the Chiefs. I don't know why yeah. I got him stuck in my head. Brian Flores. Okay. Yeah. You know who it's not? Adam Gase. <laughs> Moving Who's right along. Trevor Lawrence. Four years from now, it could prove to be one of the best moves to be super bad. <laughs> Yeah. Oh. oh goodness. Um, what effect will AJ Hinch have on the Tigers? Uh, first off, I'm a Tigers fan. This one comes in from Jamie Lado. I'm gonna let you, you know? go and let me get it done because I have no idea. Sorry, it's, it's all right. Have... So he was I'm the sure. head. He was the head. The head manager of the Houston uh, Astros, Astros that won a couple World Series and one or one or two. Gosh, now I'm drawing a blank. I think they won. They won at least one. Mm -hmm. um, but obviously, they got caught cheating and stuff. 
Yeah, I think he can coach. I think uh, he can manage, and I think the Tigers will uh, benefit from having them on her ros- their roster, but I don't think he's as good as uh, maybe we think because of the cheating and how good that roster was, period. Well, I'm just happy for you. Now you've got a cheating head coach in both football and baseball. I mean, that's got to be that's got to feel good that you know you got the rule book on your side. <laughs> Sorry, I there's a ton unbelievable. Of- there's a ton of people watching that would have been remiss if I would have left that opportunity <laughs> on the table. That was for them. I didn't want to do oh, it. I had, goodness. Oh, I had, goodness. I had to do it. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> uh, college football predictions from Angie Brash. We kind of already hit on that, but if you had to give your final four right now uh, for me, it's. I think Alabama goes one. I think Ohio State overtakes Notre Dame for two. Notre Dame stays three, Clemson four. But either way, I think Notre Dame and Ohio State are playing each other in the first round, which is going to be fantastic for our area. That's and, the, and Clemson ooh. Bama is fantastic yeah, for Notre Dame. Is good. That's going to be a fantastic weekend or day or however they do that of football. It's going to be phenomenal if that stays true. But I don't see it going any other way. Yeah, and I don't, again, I don't have the schedule in front of me, but Ohio State and Notre Dame are scheduled to play each other very soon, within the next year or two. So this is a fun matchup for that reason alone. Uh, Jordan Hall comes in with the question, who has the hotter seat, James Franklin or Jim Harbaugh? James Franklin currently sitting at 0-3 with Penn State. Jim Harbaugh currently sitting at 1-2 with the Michigan Wolverines. For, uh, uh, for me, it's Harbaugh. Okay. Expectations were up here. Um, and you're, you're not winning. Now, James Franklin, the fact that they're 0-3 is crazy to me, but it's only one less loss than what Michigan's got. I think it's Harbaugh. I mean, their fans are calling for him to be fired. Penn State fans are still a little bit happy with what James Franklin's been able to do. I, I've got an interesting take. I'm going to answer it first. I think James Franklin has the hotter seat, and here's why. One, I think Jim Harbaugh's expectations of wanting to win so many games is actually higher than the people at Michigan hiring him. I think they're okay with his win total. I think that's why he still has a job. I believe Jim Harbaugh, in my opinion, will never be on the hot seat because Jim Harbaugh loses the Michigan job when he doesn't want to coach there anymore. It, I believe it's up to Jim Harbaugh, which I've heard a lot of things that him and Michigan are going to part ways after this, and I don't believe Jim will coach in the NCAA ever again. He might go back to the NFL, which I think would be smart. I think he's done in college. But Franklin, I believe Penn State may, if, if they keep, if, if they don't win a lot of games, Franklin's seat will get hot because I think he could lose the job without wanting to. I don't think Jim Harbaugh can win eight or more games in a normal season. I know this one's shorter, but win eight or more games and be fired. I just think Jim Harbaugh, it's his job till he doesn't want it anymore, or unless he two wins or something incredibly terrible. But I, I know his seat may be hot from the fans, but I don't think that matters. We're still watching the games. They're still getting there. When they open this the, the big house, they're going to get their ticket sales. They're not too worried about the fans wanting the coach out and that's why i think franklin's like seat will be hotter in that sense of the word jim harbaugh doesn't lose the job until he leaves i don't think he'll be fired or they would have done it already with his no, I, I agree that jim harbaugh will not be fired they will so part ways after the season in my opinion i don't think he'll be fired I and agree. that's why i don't know if his seat will be hot because if if they were worried about wins his record against rivals, he would have been gone by now. I don't think that's even disputable. Yeah, He might have been fired right after that loss against Michigan State this year. Yeah. Next question coming in from Kyle Miller. If the Jets have the number one pick, which they will, by the way, does Lawrence stay at Clemson one more year? We both are 100% agreeance, and I haven't even talked to you about this. Nope. Trevor Lawrence is going to the NFL. Give me the $24 million and put me in the NFL. We'll see what happens. I don't think you can unanimously know you're going to be the number one pick. And then just, it also would hurt his image because everyone would know if he stayed at, it kind of hurts him that the Jets are going to get the number one pick already, because even if he wanted to stay at college, it's going to look like he didn't want to go to the Jets. So with that being said, 
Is he going to be like, oh, this kid believes he's so good that he's too good that he gets to decide which NFL team he plays on? I believe it hurt Eli's career early when he said, I'm not playing for the Chargers. And, and that whole fiasco happened. And secondly, if they don't get Trevor Lawrence, what's making them be better next year? Like, they're going to have the, the top three pick next year. You can say, oh, Trevor Lawrence didn't come out, so they take Justin Fields number one. Okay, I, I don't think – I don't even know if Trevor Lawrence is enough to turn this franchise around or Justin Fields or one guy. I think whether they take Trevor Lawrence, Justin Fields, anybody, they're still going to be a top five draft pick next season, especially with the, the Bills and the Dolphins and their division on the incline. And look at the whole AFC. All these young quarterbacks we're talking about are all over the NFC. Deshaun Watson, Josh Allen, Tua Tugavaiola, Lamar Jackson, Joe Burrow, Justin Herbert, um, what Ryan Tannehill is doing in Tennessee. Like, all these young quarterbacks, the AFC was the weaker conference for, like, six, seven years, and all those quarterbacks have come into the AFC. So, I mean, they've got – you got Jared Goff and Carson Wentz out in the NFC. Maybe I'm missing somebody. But all the young studs, they're all over there. Patrick Mahomes, sorry, excuse me, he's only in year four. We forget that, or three, or whatever. So – Year the four, AFC, third playing year. The AFC's tough, and the the Jets aren't getting good anytime soon. So Trevor Lawrence might as well take his money, get into the NFL, and see what he can do in New York. Build your brand. Yeah, my biggest points are kind of what you already hit on. If the Jets don't take – if let's say he stays at Clemson, okay? Which, by the way, real quick, the next question after this one is, do you think Trevor Lawrence goes back to school if the Jets get the first pick, or does he force a trade? First off, he's going to come out. He's not going back to Clemson. He already said that, basically. Okay, He said he, his goal was to always do that. Second thing, he's not going to force a trade because the team is bad. The franchise is not bad. The Jets have had their ups and downs. We're talking 10 years ago, they went to back-to-back -back AFC championships. So it's not completely out of the question that they can be good again. Just got something in my head just real quick off that. Just piggyback, then you keep going. Trevor Lawrence goes to the Jets. They're getting a new head coach, Adam Gase. Absolutely. Absolutely. Who? And they will, they will fire Adam Gase way before the draft to even remotely right. throw out the chance that Trevor's like, I'm not going to play for them. Guess who has them. Guess who's a really good coach, but hasn't been able to get the quarterback right for a while. A guy who might part ways with Michigan. Jim Harbaugh goes to the NFL to coach the Jets, drafts Trevor Lawrence, takes that team. and does, I mean, is it impossible to think that could be his NFL gig? I don't know, but keep going. I'm, I'm actually right there with you. So, but let's play hypothetical to what you guys are trying to say here. He stays at Clemson. The Jets have the number one pick. They will not take Justin Fields because they have Sam Darnold. They will take Trevor Lawrence because at this point, he would be considered generational talent and your fan base would kill you if you didn't take him. Right. I don't think your fan base is killing you if you pass on Justin Fields. Or, I mean, would you? If the Steelers passed on Justin Fields right now, would you be upset? <laughs> well, Big Ben is a totally different situation than no, Sam Darnold. No, no, no. You have Big Ben still. You have the number one pick. You have Big Ben. Would you be mad if you guys passed on Trevor Lawrence? I, I think I would be disappointed. What Ben's about got Justin a Fields? Three years. Or, but what? Oh, definitely Trevor Lawrence. But Justin Fields, yeah, I, that's what I meant to answer the first time. I thought that's what you said. Yes. I, I think we. I was kind of upset when we passed on Jalen Hurts in the second round this year. Interesting. Because because there's Big Ben and then nothing. We have Mason Rudolph's bad. Josh Dobbs isn't that good. So the Steelers are a different situation with Ben having a max of two or three years left. Yeah. And I believe if he wins the Super Bowl, he's leaving. I I actually, yeah. Sorry so, for another so day, but I agree with you. Different situation than having Sam Darnold on a rookie contract. But if I'm a yeah. Jets fan, no, we keep Sam Darnold. We run it back. We're terrible again. Let's get Trevor Lawrence when he has to come out. I don't think he's staying. I think it's, I think it's a waste of breath. Just he's not. He's going. Stay. And here, here's why I think he's not going to have a problem with going there. First off, it's New York. The New York alone, th there's something to that. Though I don't want to admit it, there is something to that. Okay? It works for people. Trevor Lawrence is New York. Just look at the dude. Look at him and tell me he doesn't fit in the New York market. It would be huge for them, okay? That alone, Trevor Lawrence and a new head coach, whoever it is, whether it's Harbaugh, 
whether it's the enemy, whether it's uh, doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. Whoever it is, as long as they have some sort of an offensive mind and can coach this game, uh, Todd Bowles ain't going to go back there. But, I mean, Todd, Todd Bowles is going to go back to Oklahoma. Oklahoma. What's that? Maybe Lincoln Riley from Oklahoma. Lincoln Riley walks. Yeah, who knows? Who knows? But maybe Dabo. Maybe Dabo. Uh, uh, I mean, who knows? Who knows? You get it up from the Jets, you can't really turn it. I mean, you can't. Regardless. The Jets will have a different head coach. They will have a new quarterback. They're not going to be tied to really any contracts because they let Adams go. They let Bell go. I don't know what the Adams, Adams is. Speaking of Adams and Bell going, in terms of the money loss from COVID, whose jersey are you buying? Only Trevor Lawrence. All Jets fans, they go to buy a jersey. There's no Jamal Adams. There's no Le'Veon Bell. Who else's jersey would you buy? Yeah. There'd be, there'd be Trevor Lawrence jerseys. Mass sold number one jersey for probably two three years. The 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 thing of it is 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 this is a this is a perfect situation for Lawrence because he's going to be the starter right away. And the it's, money it, you're going to make the number one the, pick. The money that everybody wants to be the number one pick. Okay, if Lawrence wanted to be drafted twenty fifth overall and go to a good team, then he could do that. But that's not that's not what's going to happen. You're the uh-huh. number one pick. You want to be the number one pick, and you want to turn that franchise around. Everybody wants to be Peyton Manning. Get drafted number one overall, take four years, and turn yourself into a national powerhouse for 10 years. Everybody wants that. They don't want to be Baker Mayfield, where you get drafted late. Or I'm sorry, he went first. They don't want to be Johnny Manziel, where you get drafted late, you get to start right away, but you suck. Okay, yeah, Aaron, Aaron, uh, Aaron Rodgers worked out. Patrick Mahomes worked out. Those are, those are few and far between. I mean, a lot of the players that are in this league do get drafted later, but there's still plenty of good quarterbacks that make it out, out of the, you know, the top five. You got to make it work. There's a little bit of everything. The Jets getting a fresh start, new coach, new quarterback. I don't know. I think there's something there. And the fact that it's New York, that alone, that's enough to get Lawrence out. Lawrence ain't staying, guys. Okay, that's all we're getting at. Jets haven't had a great quarterback since Namath. So if yeah. you could you could potentially bring that team to win a Super Bowl, your name's up there with Joe Namath. I mean, yeah. just yeah. even that is yeah. – you take that. Well, they had far for a year, a rental. But, yes, I also agree. Fumble for Mark Sanchez, so there's that. <laughs> uh, how many games will it take to win the horrid NFC East? That question comes in from Jordan Hall. I have a magic number in my head. I'm wondering what yours is. The Mine Eagles. Is no, um, the Eagles. Oh, well, okay. So I guess the Eagles have three wins. They have eight games left. I think the Eagles could win half of them. I think they're Don't good the enough Eagles to have a tie though too. Yeah, they're three, four, and one. That's so, why I believe five will be enough because they don't have well, an extra an extra loss. Yeah, so I guess five, five, ten, and one will be better than five and eleven. Okay, I have the Eagles going, going seven, eight, and one. What? I have them. I think the Eagles will split their last eight games. I think the Eagles are good enough to win four of their next eight. So, but the thing is, is who's going to be the second best team in the division? Because that determines how many more wins you need to win. I think the Eagles win this division. Um, the what are the Giants and Cowboys? Are they both sitting at two wins? All three of them. Giants, Cowboys, and Washington all currently sitting yeah. with two wins. I don't, I don't see those teams winning more than three games. So it will take the Eagles to win five games. So 5-10-1 and one would win the division. So five would win. But yeah. I have the Eagles going 7-8-1, and one, and, and they run away with the division. The Eagles have eight games left. Carson Wentz, the defensive line. They get some pieces back. They'll get, you know, if they can start to get healthier, let's not forget that the Eagles were projected to win nine games. I think they can still get there with their quarterback. I, I'm i not ready to give up on the Eagles yet. Let's say they, they, they go 500 the rest of the season and they go seven, eight, and one, and they're in the playoffs. But I think they only need five wins. Two more questions here. We're going to wrap it up. <clears throat> Looking for a quick response here because, I mean, this could go long. Do you think LeBron has one more title run left? Multiple. I agree. 100% agree. Do you think otherwise? I don't know what you're watching. And I guess one real quick nugget, and I'll move on here. If LeBron wins a championship in this offseason where he has, like, 70 days off, 
I, I don't want to hear any more excuses. I'll be done. Until Let's LeBron see. shows decline, my faith in him won't show decline. Yeah, I agree. Uh, coming in from Robbie Edwards. He says, I saw this on the Pat McAfee show. Who's the biggest stooge of the season so far, whether it's coach, player, front office, etc." I'm going to start because yours is a little better than mine, but I have my opinions on this. For me, it's a coach. It's Brian. It's uh, Bruce Arians. And here's why. The Buccaneers have been irrelevant. You, as a coach, have been mostly irrelevant. I think he has three playoff appearances in his entire coaching career. Um, I think two of them came with the Cardinals, and one of them came as an uh, interim head coach of the Colts. Are you doing only head coach? Yeah. Okay, because he was the OC for the Steelers. Uh, oh, he's been an OC for lots of people. He's been <clears> in the league. He was Peyton Manning's. He was yeah. Ben Roethlisberger. No, I'm talking about as a head coach, okay? For the most part, though, you haven't really done much, okay? And, you know, last year your team was abysmal in your first year there. You know, that you had some shine parts, but mostly nothing. This year you have aspirations to be the first team to host a Super Bowl. And I feel like every time this dude gets a chance, he's taking shots at Tom Brady that he didn't take at Jameis Winston last year. I'm sorry. There's nothing that you've done in this league that is warranted to publicly talk down upon Tom Brady. Period. Bill Belichick went 20 years, 20 freaking years in this league with Tom Brady. Okay? And there were plenty of times Brady was the reason they lost. There were plenty of times Belichick was. Okay, they have lots of losses together. Hell of a lot of wins, but they got a lot of losses too. Okay, teams lose. Teams have bad performances. Tom Brady on Monday Night Football against the Chiefs back in 2014 shit the bed. The famous on to Cincinnati game. Okay, where they got decimated by the Chiefs on Monday Night Football. Brady was pulled. Okay, for Jimmy Garoppolo late in the game. At that point, the game was over. After the game, they asked they asked Bill Belichick. Tom looked a little rough out there. Is there a quarterback controversy? He laughed in their You know what you have at quarterback. Bruce Arians is pretending he doesn't know. You're a stooge. Get real. I don't care how old Tom Brady is. Right now, he's definitely not the reason your team is losing. And he's not the only reason you're winning. But he's damn sure one of the top reasons. I mean, let's be fair here. I will agree with with that um, to an extent. Like Bruce Arians has been terrible in front of the mic. I don't think anyone would disregard that. He looks like a goofball with that face mask. Like we saw Andy Reid for a second, and then it goes to Bruce Arians on the sideline. He looks like a goofball. Yeah. Um, my biggest stooge. I don't think anybody seems more just like they're daydreaming than Mike McCarthy of the Dallas Cowboys. Yeah. It, I, I don't even know what's going on with the Cowboys. They've looked so bad this year. Even with Dak playing so well, they were losing in the beginning of the year. Uh, just from when he first got the job, saying that he looked like he watched all the tape. And then, like, when he got his first interview with the team, he's like, I was just trying to get a job. Like, he just seems so dumbfounded. And the more I watch Mike McCarthy, the more I realize literally Aaron Rodgers carried this guy's career to what he's known as. And um, Mike McCarthy, I do have one little second, second um, answer. I think Matt Nagy deserves a lot of criticism for how bad he's done at the quarterback position since he's been the Bears coach. I know this isn't just a one year thing, but like the drafting of Mitch Trubisky over the other guys, um, bringing in Nick Foles, but still starting Mitch Trubisky, bringing in Nick Foles. They, they just they have no passing game all year. And this team's roster is really good. And yeah. Matt Nagy can th- – this offense should be better better at scoring. They're one of the worst teams at scoring in the league. And I, I think Matt Nagy has been – I think a lot of people could say he's a failure. He got the number one seed one year in, in the NFC and then blew it. And outside of that, he's been I, – I can't find one Bears fan that's like, yeah, thank goodness Matt Nagy's here because our team's been so good. I think the Bears should be doing better than what they're doing, but that would be my my best answer is Mike McCarthy. I think has been the biggest stooge of of the year so far, in my opinion. Yeah, no, I'm I'm with you there. And the only reason I said Arians is just because it's like, God, man, just take some credit for yourself. You know, you you get beat 
was it 38-3? What was the final of that Saints game? 38-3? Mm-hmm. You get decimated and you blame Tom Brady? Come on, man. Saying Mike Evans was open on some of those routes? Stop but it. Stop Mike it. Evans hasn't been open on some Marshawn Lattimore since, like, Christopher Columbus game over. Yeah, I don't care who's at quarterback. I, it, it doesn't even matter. We're not going to get too much more roast into it. You don't roast your players like that. It doesn't matter who You don't it do is. it. You don't do it. You don't roast your players, and you sure as hell don't yeah. roast your Hall of Fame quarterback that just signed with you. So Yeah. I, yeah. I, yeah. I am go, – going forward, though, I am very excited to talk on the NBA. Um, we decided to leave those questions out because we went an hour and 15 um, without the NBA. Um, God, I, I kind of want to talk about it right now, but I, I know we've gone quite a bit of time. So, so that's a podcast for another day. I'll hold off. but. Uh, I'm sure you guys are all seeing in the news that the Rockets are pretty much falling apart. Like, yeah. bad, quick, their coach is gone. James Harden isn't taking any calls from teammates via report. Westbrook wants out. Ah, the Rockets, they were all hype. They yep. never amounted to anything. They were all hype, and uh, we'll see where they go forward. But yep. um, I'm not going to get into it because it's about for another day, but I will answer with a yes or no on one question we didn't touch on. Is Chris Paul locked for the Lakers, or do you think he's going there? Do you know who asked that question? Was it's it Jordan, Jordan Hall. Do you think Chris Paul is a lock to end up with the Lakers? And the answer is no. I agree. But I, I don't think he's in OKC, though. And I'll have more on that in a future pod. I agree as well. Yeah. The Lakers are definitely an option, Jordan, if I'm answering your question. They're an option, but they're not a lock. I think Chris Paul earned himself uh, a, a – a trip to another team because I don't think OKC is okay with just making the playoffs. I think they want to tank and getting Chris Paul on their team, unfortunately did not equate to that. So <laughs> that seemed really good. <laughs> all right, guys, it's been a fun one. We had lots of questions. We tried to answer all of them. I know there was some, we maybe skipped over for, uh, to be answered on future pods. I hope we did you guys justice. Went just shy of a hundred uh, hour and 20 minutes here. Uh, I had a good time, Brad. I hope you did too. Yeah, I had a wonderful time. Thank you guys for the questions, and I'm sure we'll be uh, we'll be chit chatting in the uh, Real Talk fan page about these questions and and other stuff going on in sports. Appreciate the questions. Keep them coming. All right, guys. As always, catch us on the YouTube channel. You can see us uh, talking in person. Catch us on your favorite podcast channel, whether it's Spotify or Apple, and uh, catch us live live this Sunday, ten o'clock. Seem to be the uh, the time that everybody's loving and digging. We had a great uh, great showing last week, lots of interactions, and we'll be talking some football. All right, take care, guys, and go Patriots. Yep, go Steelers, go Manchester United.